So first of all, good morning, everybody. You're all very welcome to today's masterclass on employability, which is a word that we've made up. And I'll come back to that in a second. Before I get into the detail of today and what we're going to cover, I'd love to introduce or ask the panel, I should say, to introduce themselves. These are guys across a number of industries who are sharing their insights today with us. I think it would be super useful and beneficial to hear what they, what they have to say on these topics. Um, I'll start with myself before we go into the panel, actually. So my name is Keith Grant. It's lovely to, to meet you all or you meet you all. I am a recruitment manager at Engage People Recruitment. I'm only recruiting about a year and a half, uh, to be honest with you. My background is in banking. So what I did the guts of probably 15 or 16 years with a number of financial institutions in Dublin and, and abroad before I made the move, as I said, about a year and a half ago into banking. So my background in banking is mainly back office. I did some cash operations. I did a bit of AML, AML and compliance. Um, then I moved into more of an infrastructure role and I was director of operations. I was a COO actually in operations for a couple of years before I decided to do something completely different and moved into the recruitment space. Best thing I ever did. Um, that's another story for another day though. I'll move over to the panel. We're it's del I'm delighted to have three um, very different and unique people to talk about their insights and their company's insights today. I'll start with Laura and Michelle Sick. Laura, would you like to give us a little bit of an overview of to yourself? Thank you, Keith. Yeah, this is Laura and Michelle Sick. Hi, nice to meet you all. Um, I am a, a vice president at Deutsche Bank. I'm based in Ireland. I live and work in Dublin, Ireland. I'm from New York originally born and bred New Yorker. And um, I'm here today uh, representing my bank and representing the sort of employer. And uh, yeah, sure, I've been at Deutsche Bank for, gosh, you know, almost 13 years, uh, seven of which have been in Ireland. And at the moment, so for the past couple of years, I've, I run our people and communications function for the corporate bank. Um, but if you ask me what I do, you know, I kind of do everything. I work in the change and transformation space. I'm a program, you know, director. I have worked in the regulatory space, relationship management and, you know, reporting, um, client relationship management. And in a former life, I was actually an elementary school teacher. So <laughs> if you ask me what I do, it, there's what I'm doing now. And there's certainly what I did, which is uh, kind of exciting. And um, and yeah, I think I, uh, hopefully I can share some of my experience having lived and worked in different countries. And uh, yeah, really excited to be here today and, and happy to join the panel. Real busy little bee. Thanks so much, Laura, for your time today. Uh, we'll pass on to Michael Gorman. Michael, do you want to give us an overview? Thanks a million, Keith. So I work with uh, Keith here at Engage People. So my role in the business is I lead up the financial services and banking, which has definitely been an interesting uh, space the last while. With Engage People, probably about five years now. Uh, so I would have studied business and done my master's in retail and uh, spent a lot of my time in that space. So fairly significant change. But running alongside that, I was a director of one of the larger credit unions in North Dublin uh, during the financial crash, for those of you uh, who remember that. And uh, a lot of change, um, a lot of challenges very fortunate time for me in a lot of ways in that I was you know probably at, at an early stage in my career and got exposure to lots of stuff that you know m maybe most people my age didn't and I had great support from guys there learned a lot about how financial services were structured about how the regulatory environment evolved really great grounding and so it just made sense for me to come in on the financial service and banking side when I eventually made that move my other full-time job is that I'm father to a four-month-old and um, my pastimes include uh, being a mediocre park runner and probably filling the guys in on my mediocre park runs and coffees that I have then on a Monday morning and um, that is myself. Lovely, thanks for that Michael. Again, thanks for taking the time to do this today, I appreciate it. And finally, last but not least, Sarah Stritt, do you want to give us an introduction please? Yeah. First and foremost, hello to everyone who's joined this morning. Just to give a background on myself, I am, my name is Sarah Stritch. I'm the talent acquisition specialist at Mediolanum. So just a bit about me. I've been in recruitment talent acquisition for the last five years, started my career out in the UK, working within the financial services space there, start recruiting for accountants essentially. Moved home about two years ago and I've been with Mediolanum nearly for two years now and we're, it's an asset management company, so quite a diverse array of stuff that I'm recruiting for. 
quite a busy place. We've grown quite significantly over the last couple of years. But that is me in a nutshell. And essentially outside of that, you'll often find me trying all the new restaurants in Dublin or traveling. Yeah, those are probably if summing myself up a little bit. Yeah. Lovely. Thanks for that, Sarah. And thank you to the panel. And um, the panel is structured this way by design. So really what we wanted to do was have the voice of the hiring manager, which hopefully Laura and you can opine on given your role at Deutsche. We also want to hear from in-house TA slash or HR, which Sarah, you can opine on. And then Michael will be able to give his thoughts on the market more generally, given the clients and that and cans that he's interacting with on a daily basis. So I hope you'll find the content today exciting and interesting. Um, and speaking of the content, I guess where the theme employer came from is the results of a market insights slash salary survey that engaged people did towards the end of last year. Um, it gave us really interesting and useful salary information, which we'll probably come on to as part of the discussion. But really what I thought and what actually the company thought was quite interesting in terms of the output from that insight survey was more around comments that the candidates in particular were making around employers of choice and the kind of companies that they want to work for or the perception of companies that they want to work for. And it wasn't just looking at compensation, although that's an important part. It was also looking at there was comments about people potentially looking abroad for careers or people looking at ideal employers that were put up on a pedestal and I really want to work for such and such because they're supposed to be amazing um, or XYZ companies using real savvy tech. I want to get into that kind of industry or into that kind of type of company. Um, also comments around diversity and inclusion, which was important to a lot of people and not just diversity and inclusion from a gender balance perspective, which obviously is important um, and not just about senior females in leadership positions, but actually comments around flexibility in the workplace with regards to you know different family structures and family ties types, those pieces on LGBT diversity and inclusion, um, etc. So I think there's, there's a lot of food for thought and lots to digest around the output from that market insights. And I thought, as I said, it would be good to get people from the industry involved in the conversation to hear really what they have to say on this topic. Um, afterwards, just to be to be clear with everyone, you may not have seen our market insights guides. We'll be, we'll be distributing that to, to all of the attendees and it'll be up on our website as well for download in the near future. So look, let's get into the topics. Um, I'll start with the question that maybe recruiters get the most. So Michael, I might go to you in the first instance and then we can work from there. Mar Michael, how are you finding the market at the moment? Yeah, cheers Keith. We were just talking about this before the webinar started. It's, it's like there was obviously those, you, you know, you can watch too much news sometimes. We always say that and it's quite often more more bad news than good. Really, I suppose, through the back end of last year and into this year, so the start of January is always a, a little bit quiet, but we've seen fairly consistent volumes and most of our clients are, you know, continuing to hire. In some cases, it's it's more specialised roles, but there's very few who aren't hiring at the moment. And I think that's an important message to get across because you can read the news a bit uh, and see the bad news stories. I think there's been some good news as well. Might look now like Ireland's not going to go into a recession. Um, we're probably still feeling at least so on my side and the financial services we're probably still seeing an evolutionary benefit of Brexit and companies continuing to come over here and new names popping up in the market as well and um, I think one trend in particular in the market at the moment is that firms are better able to plan than maybe they could have done maybe 12 or 18 months ago um, one client in particular that we popped out to there just in the last week or two were able to tell us the hiring plans for 2025. Now, I'm not, I'm not sure that's necessarily everyone who can do that at the moment, but whether the headcount is stagnant or whether the headcount is growing, what, what is kind of consistent is that a lot of firms have much more, trend, the, the crystal ball is a little clearer, let's say. Um, and what was also kind of impressed me was that it was a lot of different people within the business who were able to talk about that. P people were kind of, the, the plans were permeating the business and people were talking as if them and the company were one. And there just seemed to be a real sense of alignment that is coming back to the market. All, all positive stuff, I would say. Brilliant. And then Sarah, from an in-house perspective, does that echo, does that resonate with you in terms of your experience at Mediolanum? Yeah, I definitely would agree with Michael there. We have seen a lot of negative articles in the last six months, definitely with layoffs within the tech sec sector specifically. I would say 2022 was quite a unique year. We were definitely dealing with the repercussions of 2020 and 2021. People hadn't been moving. I think some companies did stop hiring and we're waiting to see how COVID panned out. So last year was a very busy year. I think lots of people moved 
people even move twice. Salaries are quite high as well at the moment, just with, I'm seeing a lot of companies are counter offering as well to get people to stay. And I think people are trying to keep their current staff. So salaries have been increasing. So that's kind of what we've been seeing over the last year from our perspective. We're continuing to hire. I do, in terms of headcount, we don't like have massive headcount for new headcount for 2023. But I would say that we're there's still stuff from 2022. So it's more backfilling people that have left or moved on or have been promoted within the organisation. Real. And Laura, and I guess from from Deutsche, massive brand in the market. Uh, for, for your own perspective, are, are you guys hiring, or have you hired specifically over the past couple of months? And how have you found the market? Yeah, I find that when, um, you know, we talk about these sort of big macro topics, you know, inflation and Brexit and, you know, how's the market doing? And for me personally, or I suppose in my my little world, you know, I'm more, I just, I'm sort of more of a micro person. And I look at the opportunities that have on on my team. I see what we're doing, you know, in our lo- you know, in our in our region and our locality in Ireland. But then I also think, you know, from a bank perspective, like we're hiring all over the place. So, um, so good news is, Deutsche Bank is hiring. Um, you know, you can Google us anytime, and you'll see in the news that we've had quite a, a few years of um, transition, and we've decided to, you know, sort of take our Irish footprint in a different direction. And, you know, we're sort of coming out of this, coming out of lockdown and things like that with a more strategic um, front office, you know, senior focus for our office here in Dublin. And um, so I am hiring. The roles aren't always in Ireland. But that being said, um, we do have opportunities here. And I think when you join Deutsche Bank, like the possibilities are endless. This isn't necessarily a a pitch to join join the bank. but. you know, I was with Deutsche Bank in New York and I moved to Ireland with Deutsche Bank. And so, you know, you never know, you could end up in, in our Irish Dublin office anytime. Brill. And actually on that point, and I think I mentioned this earlier as part of the, the scene setting piece, some of the comments that we saw with the Market Insight survey were around migration is the wrong word, but essentially candidates in the Irish market felt they'd have better opportunities abroad um, and moving to other countries. I guess, Sarah, from from your experience recruiting, are you seeing that there's a shortage of certain talents in the market or are are candidates talking to you about about moving away from, from the Irish market and into other markets? For sure. And even amongst peers and people that I know, everyone is kind of finding Dublin. Dublin is quite an expensive place to be at the moment. And even throughout 2020 and 2021, a lot of people actually used it as an an opportunity to possibly weren't they weren't able to afford a house in Dublin. So they maybe relocated back to where they were, bought a house there. And now they're in the situation where their worker asking, oh, hey, can you come back to Dublin now? And that's obviously not a runner for them now. So we're, I'm seeing a lot of that. So with candidates, they might be based now in Wexford and they don't want to come back to Dublin. And as well, amongst peers, I think the cost of living, Dublin at the moment just being a little bit difficult with inflation and all that kind of good stuff. So yeah, there is a little bit of that happening. So as well, I think the Irish, we're quite a flighty nation. We do like to travel. We do like to go to Australia. We like to go to Canada. So I think for two years, a, like a significant amount of people weren't able to do that. So I think at the moment there is quite a mass exodus going to Australia, to Canada, and that's to experience a new culture, possibly see something different. So I think it's a combination of both those factors, I would say. And I'm wondering, and I, I see that too, actually, to be honest, and I'm wondering, is there any sort of strategy that companies are having? Is that at, at the forefront from a hiring or recruitment perspective? Yeah. And that companies are doing things to maybe attract that talent or keep that talent here. Have you seen, seen anything in, in your organisation, Sarah, or maybe Laura Anna at Deutsche? Is there anything going on in that space? So from our perspective, what we're kind of doing with, I suppose, up to five years out of college, essentially, so relatively new in the workforce, we invest in them heavily. So basically further education, that's something that we're doing. So let's say you're with the company a few years and you want to do a course, we're, investigate, we're investing in that. So further education for sure. And I think just before Christmas, we're all, we've are all we all been affected by the cost of living crisis, no matter what salary you're on. So we did kind of a payment before Christmas as well and a voucher for people as well. So I think those are the two things we personally did as a company to try and trying to alleviate the problem and we're investing in people as well. 
Yeah, I'd say for Deutsche Bank, you know, it's not it's not so much that we as a bank have this concerted effort to market our Irish office abroad to say come and work for us in Ireland, but we are we just we do that through all of our memberships in industry groups and we do that through like the Irish German Chamber of Commerce, you know, our former chief country officer is the president of that organization. We do that through, you know, participation in fusion, right? Financial services inclusion network. You know, we want to be the employer of, we want Ireland to be the country of choice for LGBTQ plus, you know, and allies as well. So, so uh, something we also, we do see kind of surprisingly, and maybe this is something we should latch onto, is not so much that maybe young talent is leaving Ireland because there aren't opportunities, but a lot of people tend to come back to Ireland, maybe when they want to settle down and have kids and they really love the schools and things like that. So something that we do want to look at is, um, you know, what do those people need? Are they families? Is it school systems? You know, is Dublin the right place? I mean, we don't have any plans to go to any other parts of Ireland at the moment, but, you know, what kind of uh, what kind of place are we to work for those type of people? So I think we I think inadvertently we're hitting all of these um, you know wonderful target populations. Interesting, and that's that's probably something that we hadn't mm. considered, Laura. And is that the idea or notion of people actually coming back to Ireland and looking for for a job? And I guess Michael, with with you speaking, say to the candidates that you speak to, are you seeing more of people coming back to Ireland looking for a job, or is it more of candidates that you're speaking to have no interest because they're moving abroad, or is is it a mix? Yeah, so 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 there's actually been lots of really good points uh, made there. I think one of the things that could be happening. So we we, we we us Irish we do like to travel a little bit. That's for sure. That was the topic of conversation before the webinar. Um, I think there's, there's, there was a couple of bottlenecks occurred during COVID. So when we seen a high level of um, job movement in 2022. Th there was talk of the great resignation. These pieces, I, I, I think, the motivations were maybe a little overstated on that front, and it, and and it could have been there would have been people who might have naturally moved roles during COVID that just couldn't or didn't because of the circumstance we found ourselves in. We had that bottom luck. And to the same extent, there's probably a lot of people who would have went abroad and traveled during that period as well that just couldn't. And I think we're experiencing maybe the bottleneck of that coming through. So so, so I'm hopeful that as the kind of the year progresses that we into 2024, that we're seeing less of that absolutely agree with what Lauren is saying about people looking to come back to Ireland. I probably spoke to three or four people this week looking to do exactly that. Here's one of the challenges that probably exists there is that quite often, you know, that they've gone to you know, London or wherever it has been really, really successful coming back on a very high salary. Um, coming back to what is, as Sarah rightly said, is not, not the cheapest place to live anymore. And just in a, in a smaller market it is all those roles that are sometimes specialized are they there at the right level the good news is that like ireland is quite an attractive place for a lot of different reasons and many of these conversations probably more so than i'd re um, seen in the past is people who are coming back are prepared to concede on things like salary and different pieces to facilitate that move and so i think there is a big opportunity uh, where kind of um, companies and uh, expats can have a meeting of minds and find things that work. There's a lot of good talent coming back on that space, I, I'd suggest, just at the minute. And if I could add to that, what, what I kind of see, what I hear from this conversation and what I personally have experienced is that it's all about the long game. People, people need to plan for, you know, hopefully a long life and you know i think deutsche bank for instance and I, I think a lot of banks in general that's what they're selling is the long game so maybe you come back to ireland and you don't make as much as you did in london or new york but you know what you do have you know pension and the health care and it's just they have to they have to sort of pitch the full package you know, and, and we can talk about base versus benefits and all that sort of thing. But, um, you know, in the long run, it's the better choice. And so that's the kind and that's what I've experienced myself as well, coming from New York City. Um, so I think that companies really need to lean into that. And um, because I, maybe more junior folks are maybe maybe younger people who are fresh into their careers, maybe aren't thinking 
uh, about that just yet. And so they want to travel and they want to have jobs, but they're not worried about what their pension contributions are and things like that. But, but I think for, um, for everyone else, it's really all about the long game. And I think Ireland really has something to offer in that respect. Yeah. Uh, and just to add to uh, what Lauren said, I think Ireland really does have, have a lot to offer. I think, and I'm looking very much in the mirror when I'm saying this, it's incumbent on us to be talking about this as much as possible. Because really, like, hopefully I'm learning stuff today from talking to the panel about um, all the different pieces and incentives there are to stick around here. There's a lot of good news stories out there, but they don't always, like, let's just come back to the piece about the news. It's not always the good news that makes the headlines, unfortunately. And I think where we can... Um, I, I, I think we need to be putting ourselves out there and talking about what Ireland has to offer on that front. And these these types of formats are excellent opportunities to be doing that. But on a company by company basis as well, just just doing our best to get the word out on this sort of stuff. I completely agree. And Lauren, you mentioned salary there. Salary is definitely a juicy topic. And a lot of the comments we got in the feedback was around salary. So we will definitely come back to that to kind of flesh that out a little bit more. The next topic is a topic that has been done to death everywhere, LinkedIn, the news, newspapers, but I'm going to go there because it was one of the topics that again had a high interest rate in terms of responses on our insight survey and that's on on-site working versus hybrid working versus remote working. Um, there's probably no right or wrong answer to, to this question but I'd just like to understand from the panel what your personal thoughts are um, in terms of what works best and maybe then from a company perspective and well, Michael maybe you can give a market view how are you guys doing and how are you how are you finding it working so maybe Laura Ann if I start with you uh, personal thoughts and then Deutsche more generally yeah my personal thought is that we should all have an option to work hybridly and so many places already had that in place and COVID and global lockdowns forced everyone else to have to, you know, make that happen. So we've proven that we can do it. We've, we've from Deutsche Bank's perspective, from banking, we've proven that we can get 90,000 people to work from home at once and, you know, our systems won't collapse on us, that sort of thing. Personally, I think that having the option is fantastic. I know it's really hard when you've also got kids at home. I don't have children myself, but I've been on plenty of conference calls, right, where the little ones come into the room, you're trying to work away. So, you know, anyway, I think I think hybrid is, it's not the future, it's happening, it's now. And from a financial services or banking perspective, banking is so slow to change, is so slow to adapt. It's, it that's just the way it is, you know, so, we are getting it wrong if we don't, you know, move in the direction of having hybrid working arrangements. We can talk to death about you should be in the office for three days a week and home for two days a week and there has to be a recipe. That's the least flexible flexibility I've ever heard to have to have a set, you know. Personally, I love being in the office. I get energy from other people and that's just my style. But, um, but yeah, banking is quite slow to um, adopt to these new ways of working. and. And we need less PowerPoint presentations about how to do it and just do it and make sure our managers and our teams are equipped to make it happen. Very interesting. Sarah, any yeah. thoughts? Yeah, it's a very interesting topic. Personally, I agree with Lauren. I think somewhere in the middle is the ultimate. I think it works the best. I think, you know, being remote completely all the time, I think you lose that piece of talking to your colleagues, bouncing ideas off each other. Whereas being in the office all the time, it's great, but I think having those days at home for me personally, I think I'm a bit more productive at home because I think sometimes in the office, people are coming up to you, you're having conversations and whereas at home, you can sit down, get a load of stuff done. That's from my perspective, what I think what we have kind of done personally as a company for the first six months when somebody joins us, our roles are office based and I fully agree with that because I've seen throughout the pandemic and we've all seen that you can onboard somebody remotely, but I think it's a little bit slower. The person doesn't get to meet people. They don't have the ability to share across questions to their colleagues, which I think is really important because sometimes we're all guilty of it. We don't always respond to Teams messages straight away. So, and then once you've that six months completed, you can then apply for up to two days working from home. I personally think it's a good model. I think over the last 12 months, initially, February 2022 when we all kind of society went back to normal if you will 
uh, people were less inclined to come back to the office. When they heard our policy, they were like, no, absolutely not. Do not want to come back to the office. But as time has progressed over the last 12 months, I've seen that people are actually like, OK, I actually understand why you want to come into the office, why you want me to come into the office, I should say. So we're seeing more buy in for sure. But again, it depends on the sector. Some sectors I've found in finance in particular, they kind of don't want to come back to the office as much. So it's really depending on the sector and the area. That's kind of the way we've been doing it and how I think it's work. It's working quite well for us, I think. Real. Uh, Michael, uh, maybe that's a good segue into your kind of thoughts from, from a sector perspective. What are you hearing from candidates and clients maybe from financial services more generally? Yeah, look, um, I, I, I'm not sure how much more I can add. Some really good points made by Laura Ann and Sarah, and it, it is a topic that comes up a lot. I'll just give a sense of the journey I feel that we've gone on since since kind of COVID started. There was a real sense. So we, we, we flew to London. It was a full plane going over uh, 24 hours later. It was an empty plane coming back. That That's how quickly they changed. And people had to still had to go to work the next morning, be it working from home or in the office. They had to deal with all these changes. And so did companies. And I have to say, I feel particularly sorry for people who worked in HR at the time because they potentially had wholesale changes to their lives. And then people were looking to them as well to be able to support them in all the changes that were happening. Um, I think what we saw at the start was that there was a little bit of what's happening here. And I wouldn't say defensiveness, but really trying to, you know, protect the lives that they had. People were worried, very genuinely worried about, um, you know, potentially family uh, being exposed to a, vi a killer virus and that. And there was a little bit of a, a, a lot of the conversation was about the rights of, and, and rightly so, the rights we have to work from home and companies about their rights to bring people back in. What's been a really positive development in a lot of the conversations that have been having recently is that people are now leading more with their values. So mm -hmm. this is what I value. I value working from home or I value the flexibility in the morning. And companies are talking more about this is our mm -hmm. culture. This is why we value having you here on certain days. And it's much more led by the values piece. And I think if there was one kind of message to the market, I think to really drive that home, because more and more where people, there might be gaps between people and employers in terms of their policy on remote working we're overcoming that much, much quicker when it's a values led conversation. Uh, and there's probably a longer conversation to be had around that. But if I was to encourage one piece in terms of employability, it would be to lead with the values of the company around why you're making decisions around remote uh, and office based work. I really like I really like what you said there, because we were forced into working from home because of a global pandemic. Right. We were we've been forced into so many things and sometimes being forced into something is where innovation comes from. Right. But we need to sort of, again, play the long game. We need to get away from, we're doing this because it's reactive. Like we're doing this now let's get smarter and learn from what we had to do and figure out what we can do. People want flexibility, right. And employability. Do people want to work for Deutsche Bank? Do people want to work in banking? Yeah, if they're going to be flexible, how many candidates, how many fantastic candidates are we going to lose out on because we can't give them what they need? And it's not that difficult to give them what we need. And we know all of the collaboration tools that are coming out. You know, it's not like everyone needs to be in the office. OK, sure. Have an anchor day where everybody comes in. But but maybe that's not possible. Maybe that's not the right answer. And how many of our leaders are, you know, I'm here in our home office in Frankfurt at the moment. and it's kind of quiet because everyone travels away to other offices. There's not a lot of people here because they leave the home office to go to other other locations. How how many in Google, the senior leaders don't even have offices because they're never there. Do you know what I mean? So I know certain jobs you kind of like need to be in place. But but I think that's what we need to get away from. You don't need to be in one place anymore. And, I, and I'm, unfortunately, a global pandemic had to happen for us to learn that. But, but yeah, our values should be about. Um, uh, you know, what people need, how to be accessible, you know, there's going to be more opportunities for different kinds of people if we have different kinds of ways of working. So I really like that concept about leading with your values. If we are who we say we are, then we can make these happen for, for our candidates. 
very insightful. Thanks for that. Yeah. You mentioned Google there, and actually, so, so full disclosure, this salary or market insight survey was done about quarter three into quarter four last year. So before things really started to happen um, in the tech industry, um, and Google actually came up a couple of times in the in the output in terms of an employer of choice or someone that companies should be trying to model themselves on in terms of culture and setup, etc. I know. When, when we look at, I'm not specifically talking about Google here, but some of the employers of choice that are out there are people that are getting it right. They talk about, you know, that full flexibility and being able to bring your dog to work and having beer in the fridge and stuff for, for employees to consume. Full disclosure, engaged people has beer in the fridge. It's a great company to work for. Um, but I'm interested here what you guys think about that concept of those in the market or across the board who, who are seen as employers of choice or are seen as getting it right. Who are they? Do you think, and why are they, why do they why do people think they're getting it right? If that makes sense, maybe Sarah, I start with you on that one. Yeah, very interesting question, and I think I would have had a firm answer six months ago. I I would have said the tech companies were doing it right. They had a very inclusive culture, quite a diverse culture. They had all those little perks of you know the meals and kind of incentivizing employees to come into the office. It's probably harder for me to say that considering kind of the recent events over the last, I suppose, three months with all the layoffs. It, financial services traditionally, I suppose, we're we're the no frills approach, I guess, to coming into the office and all like all the perks and stuff. It's not a question I really can answer right now. It's I I I don't know. Does Laura Ann or Michael have a different answer to me? But not a linear answer, I think. Yeah, well, I won't say how old I am, but. I've worked at three different financials, global financial services companies. And before 2009, there was food in the office and cars home and anything you wanted and fantastic Christmas parties. And people thought banking was just the coolest thing ever. And then the financial crisis hit. Everybody lost their jobs. Everybody lost their money. And being a banker was a bad word again. And there were no frills. You couldn't even, you weren't allowed to leave the office in groups of more than 10 because, you know, it was sort of like, oh, there are those bankers, you know, having parties again. It was, it was a very strange time. And I think, again, cri a crisis forced companies to figure out how to operate in a new way. And you know what? Maybe we don't need all that stuff, but we, you know, let's invest in benefits for our people. Let's think of other perks. Again, like what do our people actually need? Do they need fresh fruit in the pantry or do they need daycare, you know, on-site daycare, that sort of stuff. And again, I don't even have kids, but yet <laughs> this is the kind of thing that I see people, you know, actually caring about. I don't, I don't, I don't know if anyone gets it right or wrong. I mean, these things are all, it all ebbs and flows. And they're, again, years ago, in banking, we were trying to uh, attract technologists because we knew that the future was, you know, fin techs and they were coming up and we wanted to recruit those people. So we tried to be Google, but we're not Google. You know, we're a giant global investment bank that's been built by bankers. So we need, we had a bit of an identity crisis and I think that kind of failed. This wasn't with Deutsche Bank, this was with another company. Um, and I think we're still struggling with that. You know, we're trying, you know, let's put a ping pong table in the office. Like, no, that's not the thing that's going to get people to work here. So I think we have to sort of get away from fads. We have to realize that some days your your industry is going to be the hot thing. And some days SHIT might hit the fan and it can't be the greatest thing ever. So, again, play the long game and, um, you know, just try to do just try to do the right thing all the time and and not like chase you know, chase fads and things like that, in my opinion. Real. Michael, any thoughts on that? Yeah, I think I, I, I think that's a really good point that Lauren makes. Like to an extent, it maybe felt like sometimes companies were trying to be all things to everyone, whereas now we just have to think that, you know, work is part of our lives. It's not our whole lives. And so you don't have to try to get everything from the workplace that you need in your life. Sometimes you just need the space or the support to do things outside of work. And that can include, you know, the on-site crash and things like that. <sighs> This is probably not going to be the most um, like like if we're talking about 
people were impressed with. I don't want to say impressed because what, what they went through was very difficult for a lot of people, but I, I just thought the way that Stripe handled the redundancy situation and that the Collison brothers and that kind of didn't hide behind the bad news or anything like that. It's a very difficult situation and there was a lot of pain suffered by a lot of employees and their families as a result of that. But I guess I respected the way that they kind of put their faces on the bad news and led and explained that mistakes were made internally. And I just think that's helped them be like still an attractive potential employer in the future again, but by taking that approach with it. And I think that more human approach to the redundancies, they, they stick out to me of all the redundancies that unfortunately happened in that space. They, they are the ones that I recall most easily in terms of how they handled us. And so it, it, I can't say that, you know, they're doing it right. Definitely mistakes have been made, but I think people will ultimately respect that there's ownership and uh, people at the end, at, at the top of a business doing their best to make decisions. Yeah, I agree, Michael. I remember seeing a couple of comments on LinkedIn to that effect actually when all that Stripe news hit uh, hit the, the headlines. So look, let's move on to something different. Laura, and you had mentioned salary previously, and I think the number one topic that came back from candidates in terms of what would entice them to move away from their current position was more money, as simple as that. So I, I think let, let's talk about this maybe more generically in terms of your total compensation package, right? So comp, as we all know, was made up of your base salary, then there's a potential bonus element, and then there's like non-compensation benefits. Maybe Sarah, if I start with you, do you have, again, this is your personal opinion, any strong feeling towards the weighting of, of, of the total compensation in terms of where you think from the candidates you've spoken to, where's the most emphasis placed on? Interesting question. I think it depends on the seniority of the candidate. T typically within investment management, the bonuses are can be significant for different parties. I think for probably the more junior to mid-level candidates, a base salary is quite important as it's a guarantee, it's a certainty that you're going to get that salary. And I think across the board, it's always important for a person to know that at least you have that income coming in. I think all of our, I suppose, a benefits package, health insurance, pension, it's all important. I think probably graduates, people with up to five years experience, the pension isn't as important. It's not something that they're factoring in just yet, but it's as the years progress and as you realise you don't want to be working for the next 45 years, the pension is very important. So I think it really, the level of the person, the age of the person, all stuff can be equally as important, but I think the base salary continues and will continue to be an important thing for a candidate or a person coming into a company is it's a guarantee, it's a certainty. Whereas all the other stuff, it's an added bonus, but it's important to be equally competitive on that stuff because if your competitor is offering health insurance and you're not, that's something that will, when someone's making a decision to join you, they're going to, it's going to be a factor. So I think you need to be competitive. Look at what your competitors and what people are doing in the market and make sure that your package, total compensation package is matching everyone and that it's giving you a competitive edge. Interesting. And Michael, would that echo what you're seeing on the market in terms of the seniority of candidates and, and what they're looking for from a total comp perspective? Yeah, so I would be someone who cares about their pension. So hopefully that doesn't give too much away about my uh, age or anything like that. But uh, no, for sure. I mean, you, you're never going to say that, you know, salary isn't important. It, it regularly, including the most recent survey, it comes out as like the always number one or top two or three in terms of the important pieces. What is interesting in how things are developing is that the other benefits have raised in, in importance and uh, versus the base salary. So I think, uh, and this would probably be echoed in some of the conversations that I'm having now before people wanted the highest salary they could possibly get. I think the word, like if I can think of a word that might capture it, it might be uh, balance that people are looking for now. So they want to receive a fair salary that's at or above market level, but it's not a foregone conclusion that they go for the highest salary available to them uh, anymore. What they're looking for is to feel that what they're being offered is fair and at or above market level. But then after that, it becomes about those benefits and the flexibility and the other pieces as well. And I think there's maybe more sophisticated thought process going in from a professional side now in terms of how they make choices on that front. Well, Laura, anything to add on that? Yeah, I like to say that I'm all about that base. That's always my, that's my lead in. I'm all about that base. 
discretionary bonuses, commission. I I understand that different jobs, right? There's commission based, you know, um, salaries and things like that. But for me, I'm all about that base. Hook me up. The bonus is an extra. But yeah, I agree with Sarah that more junior roles, maybe they're newer in their careers, maybe they're just out of college. Coming from the States, you are burdened with hundreds of thousands of dollars in student loans. Maybe you want to get your first mortgage. So the base salary is really important when it comes to those sort of things. And then as you progress in your career and maybe you get more senior, maybe you get older and you're still junior. I mean, there's tons of people here that have been at the company. People have been at this company for 50 years and they're, you know, AVPs and vice presidents. And they're quite happy with that. I would assume that those people have whatever arrangements they need to have regarding their salary. I don't know, right? It's none of my business. But um, but yeah, from a blanket perspective, junior folks, probably more base salary. As you get longer into your career, more of a bonus sort of, you know, structure. But I would never want to be so far into my bonus that because it is discretionary and it does blow with the wind that I would be relying on that personally. Again, all about that base, play the long game. Brill, thanks for that. <laughs> Personally. Let, let's let's uh, change pace and look at something different. So again, there was a couple of comments, and I mentioned this at the beginning, on tech uh, as part of employer of choice or looking at that idea of employer of choice. The systems that they use, the technology that the teams are using, so that's important to some candidates, which to me I was quite interested in. It never would have, I mean, occasionally when I screen candidates, they ask about systems that are used, but I never would have seen it as like a marketing tool or a ploy to get candidates to join the company. Um, Laura, maybe I stick with you from a, from a Deutsche perspective or again in your own personal thoughts. Do, do you think that's a big player in terms of attracting talent, the, the tech that you use? I'm going to say yes. I am so not technical and the application, you know, you come up for your application recertification every year and mine is always like Microsoft Office. <laughs> you know, I'm just like so basic. But um no, I do find that, you know, you'll, you'll see these candidates that have incredible certifications, you know, depending, obviously, depending on what the work you're hiring on, you know, when I'm looking for a program director and it's, uh, you know, for like change management kind of roles and functions, um, you know, and they're certified in all these things, there's black belt, Six Sigma Lean, et cetera. And then they, you know, they come to a company and they're working on like a system that they worked with 15 years ago, like they should be asking those questions. So, and we should be, you know, whoever, whatever company you are out there, you know, you should be embarrassed if you're using Lotus Notes or whatever the case may be. So I think I personally haven't come into contact with that, but I can totally see where that would be the case. It's not sexy is what I would say. Yeah. Michael, what about you? Have you, have you heard about any, any comments around technology or anything from candidates or clients? Yeah, so it's it's funny. It's rarely something that's brought up by um, applicants, but it's always something they're interested to hear about. It's almost it's like the it's the marketing tool or it's the it's it's the sales piece that people didn't even know they wanted to hear about. So rarely do I speak to someone on the market and they're talking unless they've had a particularly bad experience with their current employer around the tech tools or that. Do they bring it up? But if I'm working with clients and a lot of them would be fairly sophisticated on that, uh, on this sort of stuff, they're like, they're leaning in to hear more about it. So I think maybe it's like, it, it, it's that piece that we should be promoting more because just because people aren't asking about it, I think they're very much interested to hear. Um, now, th- there'll be a couple of people in Engage People laughing that I've been asked this question because I'm certainly not the go-to guy for tech either. Hey, Lauren, you're in good company there. Um, and I do need a little bit of help with bits and bobs, but we, we do, I think, where it's really important and recruitment is actually a, a really good example of this. It's It, it has to facilitate the, the core mission around for us developing relationships and speaking to people, not replace it. So where tech can be helpful is in automating the pieces that aren't core to that or actually improving us making connections, but not replacing those interactions or, or relationships as well. And I think it's not just having the, the coolest tech tools, but it's keeping kind of true and honest and focused on what you're looking to achieve and how those tech tools are supporting that rather than replacing any of us. Um, but yeah, no doubt, I think there's a big opportunity to talk more about it, even though it's not being asked about. I think it just, it depends on the job that you're hiring for, but also if, you know, the first port of call for a new candidate 
is if they're not internal, if they're an external candidate and the first port of call is through your website or your HR recruitment function and, you know, all the way through to onboarding and then day one and like their past doesn't work, you know, that does impact. That is your employer ability. If your onboarding process sucks, if you're, you know, if unfortunately for whatever reason, like recruiting doesn't have their act together or, you know, whatever the case may be, that is a poor reflection on your company, you know, so, so that would be a big priority for me. If I'm hiring for a super technical role and I don't, you know, if we're still coding in some ancient language, like that is beyond my control. But in terms of my bank putting their best foot forward to, you know, to make the best impression and day one, you're going to look at my website and then you're going to work on the onboarding process and here's how the interviews, that needs to be seamless and fantastic. And they need to be like, they need to think this is great. So sometimes it's the easiest, it's the small things that should just work that kind of make the biggest impact, in fact. So Sarah, that could be like a personal attack from Nora Ann on the on the recruitment function in house. No shade. What are your thoughts no on that? No shade. <laughs> <laughs> I had a lovely so, time getting recruited into Deutsche Bank. I also worked for Goldman yeah. Sachs, who notoriously makes you go through thousands of interviews. I had a perfectly lovely experience with them as well, but I have found that other people maybe didn't have the same experience at other companies. Yeah, so it's a really interesting topic and I actually have two completely different answers as a business and as a county. So I think as from a business point of view, we are fairly technologically savvy and that stems from our managing director. He views not being ahead in, with technology as a disadvantage. So we're constantly doing projects, transformation process, projects internally to, I suppose, make us, you know, streamline process, make things faster. Like a year or two ago, our IT function, we went onto the cloud to a platform called Snowflake and it allows us to process a lot of data a lot faster. So yes, con continuously as a business, it's something we do. As a candidate, however, I personally, gonna throw my hands up as well, I'm not a techie person by no means. And I think as a candidate, what I tend to see is it depends on the role. For certain people, it's important, for others, it's not. And I agree with Lauren on the HR onboarding process. I think simple. If it's a simple process, if it's straightforward, if it's, I think that is the most important thing that it covers a lot of steps, but at the same time, it's not 20 steps and it's not painful for the candidate. That's what I think personally from my own perspective. Very good. Thanks for that. I have one more question that I want to ask um, before we move into a wrap up and it's on diversity and inclusion. I was surprised again on the, the comments. There wasn't a massive, massive amount, but it was definitely some comments from candidates where that was important to them in terms of a company's image in that space. And again, it's multifaceted. It's not just about one particular type of diversity and inclusion um, chapter. I suppose the cynic in me would say that some companies may use diversity and inclusion from an external perspective as a marketing ploy and to attract talent. Um, I'd be interested to know your thoughts on this topic more generally. Maybe, Sarah, we, we finished with you, so I might start with you if that's OK. What are your thoughts on this topic more generally from from a not a marketing perspective, but from mm -hmm. your own personal thoughts? Where, 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 what are your feelings on it? Yeah, it's a funny topic. I've My opinion has definitely changed over the last kind of two years since working within Medialanum. So I think from a nationality perspective, we're re a really diverse organisation, but I think something that we do struggle with is actually getting females into a certain areas. So within our investor team in particular, traditionally it's an industry-wide problem. It's traditionally a male-dominated space. So it's something that personally I think is really important. And I think we need, it's, it's it's a very difficult question. It's a different problem. It's a difficult problem to solve. And I, I don't have all the answers on that, but I think as an organization, we need to be more present. And it's something we've identified ourselves in in universities. We need to be more present at graduate fairs, show that it's a career, it's a, a potential career for people. And I think that's where it starts. It's getting the promotion out there, being at events, promoting our female staff here internally and showing I guess younger females that it's a potential career for them and because to be honest I did a general business degree and degree and it wasn't something that was ever on my radar I don't personally think I ever would have been a portfolio manager but I think it's something that people aren't, aren't always aware of it definitely in the you know earlier stages of their career so I do think it is important and it's something that we do need to keep pushing for sure. 
Brill. Michael, do you think personally that it's it's a, a big piece in terms of attracting talent? Have you heard candidates talk about their a company's DNI strategy or things like that? Yeah, look, I, I'd have fairly strong views on this. I think if companies are using it as a, a marketing ploy, it, it's not going to wash. I, I think it's going to get found out fairly quickly. Companies and people who we're talking to in the market, um, they're not asking you know, what's the policy on this stuff? They're asking, uh, and it's actually gender balance is the biggest conversation out of that at the moment as well, I, I'm finding. They're, they're asking, you know, how many women are in leadership positions, especially in financial services. Like you say, Sarah, it's, it's been a kind of a male dominated area in certain areas, like in the investment space and that. People are asking very directly how many people, how many um, women are in leadership roles and have an influence in the business and really trying to get underneath the culture of the business and where companies have strong answers to that. It, it's kind, it, it's become highly attractive for people, but both men and women in terms of joining those companies. Um, they, so, so, so I think like if there was any message coming out of this, it's it's really and truly like it, it has to permeate the business and come from the top. And it's apart from it just being an employability piece, I think it employs like, or it encourages like less group think and all, all sorts of new ideas and ways of thinking about things being brought into the business. The, the other quicker points to make that there has been some barriers to diversity in the business. Um, for instance, the, the, the visa process hasn't always been the simplest and it hasn't been something that companies have wanted to resource for people coming in particular from outside the EU. But what we've had is huge numbers coming from outside the EU to study in Ireland and some very good talent, but maybe lacking the local knowledge in that. We're seeing more people, uh, more companies in particular, engage with those visa processes now. It, it's not a perfect system by any stretch, but I think in particular at the junior level, companies are more inclined to uh, engage that process now, especially where the specific skill sets that might be in demand. But that would be try, try not to grandstand or stand up on my soapbox with any of this stuff. But I do think it's like a very important issue because it's coming up all the time at the moment. Real. Laura, and I know this is a topic that's close to your heart. What are your thoughts on this? Yeah. Gosh, where to start? Where to start? It's frustrating when companies talk about diversity and they only mean gender diversity. I mean, as a woman, gender diversity, but also historically underrepresented groups. So I think that companies need to get their act together and not just look at gender diversity. From a employability perspective, if you have when you have a candidate, let's say you're interviewing or you're at a job fair, you're talking to people, the ones that ask those types of questions, you're like, okay, they get it, it matters to them. The ones that don't ask the questions are maybe afraid to ask or maybe take it for granted, don't even think about it, whatever. So I welcome questions from people who say, you know, how do you, you know, what sort of employee resource groups do you have? Or what sort of supports will you have for me? Uh, you know, what's the career development? You know, interviews should not just be about the job. It should be like, it should be about your full, you know, your full experience at the bank. So as an interviewer, I make sure to pop that into the, the conversation as well, because they might not want to volunteer that information themselves, perhaps. I also try to be visible, right? I have my, you know, ally card up at my desk. We used to do in-person interviews. A lot of stuff is virtual now, especially if you're hiring, you know, in different countries. I have a little one behind my, um, you know, behind my seat at my, in my office in Dublin. And so I try to have those visible because it does matter. People do. I've had people say to me, oh, when I walked into Pinnacle 2, our old office in East Point, and I saw the, you know, DB Go banner for our women's committee. And I saw the DB Pride banner for LGBTQ, you know, employee resource group. That meant something to them. So fantastic. It absolutely matters. And another topic or another piece of the conversation, I think, I think sometimes leadership, they just, they just don't have the right words to talk about it. I think they do care. And they kind of just say the same thing oh we have to be diverse because our clients are diverse you know they're sort of like the the 
corporate bingo speak that they tend to say. And I think they do care and they do believe and they want to make it happen. They just maybe don't have the right words for it. So I think there's a little bit of work to be done there, but it's not, it's not just talk, you know, it's real. I mean, again, everybody knows that diverse teams make better decisions. Everybody knows that boards with more diverse people on them, you know, the companies make more money. Like we've seen all the headlines. Again, that's all the macro stuff. I like to go to the micro stuff. There's a successful senior, like C-suite level woman who's had a baby, moved back to Ireland, has a kick-ass job at a financial services company, they want to have their leadership team meeting at you know 8 a.m. on on Monday mornings, and she's like, "Nope, I have a child. That's not going to work for me." And no one ever would have thought of that if she hadn't if they hadn't have hired this woman, if they if she hadn't had that experience, and she hadn't turned and said to them, "No, that doesn't work for me. You have to change your ways." You know, you need these voices in the room to help you know to help you realize that there's more than one way of doing things. Go back to the whole, you know, flexible work arrangements and hybrid work arrangements. You know, if you don't have people telling you what they need, change isn't going to happen. So diversity is not just a buzzword. It's not just a target. It's not just a, you know, a corporate bingo card. It absolutely needs to happen. And companies should be absolutely including it in their marketing. They should be talking about it at events. They should be bringing it up in interviews. And and if someone doesn't volunteer the question, maybe they're afraid to ask. Maybe they're afraid to say, do you have a women's group? Because they think they're going to be labeled, oh, that woman, she wants her women's group. She's difficult. It's so, oh, the, do you have an LGBTQ? You know, do you have a rainbow group? Oh, he's gay. She's gay. You know what I mean? Maybe they're afraid because they're still testing the waters. So I think that people should volunteer up that information and they should sing it proudly that they have these, these organizations and that diversity means something to them. What a great note to end the session on. Thanks so much for that, Laura Ann. Thank you. Um, look, we have a minute left. I just want to say thank you all for attending. Uh, thank you in particular to our panel who have given some amazing and thoughtful insights. Sarah Stritch, Talent Acquisition Specialist at Mediolanum, Laura Ann Michelsic, VP at Deutsche Bank, and Michael Gorman, Recruitment Manager at Engage People. As I said at the beginning, we will be circulating the uh, Market Insights Survey that we referenced throughout today to all participants, and it will be available along with this uh, masterclass on our website shortly. Um, that's it. I've been Keith Grant. Thanks so much for attending and enjoy the rest of your day.